So I am not an economist, I'm an ecologist, uh, but some of my best friends are economists. Um, <laughs> and I guess what, uh, one of the main messages I want to convey today is the extent to which ecologists and economists are going to need to work hand in hand to be able to value these externalities. So um, we're all familiar with the concept of precision agriculture. Probably I shouldn't stand in front of the slide. <laughs> We're all familiar with the concept of precision agriculture, where the focus has really been on the provisioning services that we um, gain from agricultural um, land and how to um, uh, precisely imply, uh, apply inputs to maximise those provisioning services. Um, what I would like to talk to you about today is... Um, is a slightly extended concept of precision management for ecosystem services. So we've already heard people talking about the different kinds of ecosystem services that flow from agricultural land. Uh, and I want to talk about how understanding um, how uh, the, the way in which biodiversity modulates that link between land management and ecosystem services and goods that flow from land uh, can help us to uh, manage this more effectively. So um, what I'm really going to be talking about is the fact that here over on the right-hand side we have a variety of goods that are influenced by the way we manage agricultural land. Not just food, but also wildlife, uh, clean and clear water, game and fish. These are just some examples. We're also aware of how different um, gradients on agricultural land, but also different interventions, for example, reduced tillage, um, can then... Um, improve the delivery of these, these goods on the right-hand side. But what we would need to understand a little bit more effectively is the role that biodiversity plays um, in making those links. So, um, for example, we plant a buffer strip, and that will actually have an impact on a whole range of critical biodiversity, not just on the plant communities on riverbanks, but also the diversity of invertebrates, um, potentially also on um, natural enemy and pollinator diversity, etc. Et but then also, if you just influence one element of biodiversity, that has knock-on effects for a whole variety um, of goods through these, these ecosystem services. So, in reality, we're talking about two kinds of critical relationship. How uh, our management of land or different gradients, natural gradients on land, influence biodiversity. And then how those differences in biodiversity influence ecosystem service delivery. But in reality, we know a lot more about this side than we do about this side. And by and large, in the past, we've been treating um, biodiversity as something of a, of a black box, rather than really understanding the detail of how managing biodiversity can help the delivery of goods. Of course, there are many different ways in which you can uh, uh, characterize biodiversity. It could be taxonomic, functional, uh, but I, I won't go into that this time. So I'd just like to illustrate this point with just one very specific example. Um, so we know that the way in which you manage land and what you actually grow on land affects earthworm species richness, for example. And we can see here that earthworm species richness is much higher under grassland margins than under conventionally tilled <laughs> land, um, but also <coughs> that uh, low and minim minimal tillage is kind of in intermediate. But then one of my uh, team drew together all the evidence from across the literature and did a meta-analysis and he actually illustrated that there's a significant positive relationship between worm species richness and soil hydraulic conductivity because basically some species of worm are really good at going up and down, some are really good at going from side to side and so effectively what you've got here is complementarity. You have greater diversity of worm species richness that actually alters the porosity of soil. That, in turn, actually can influence um, the hydraulic processes and the runoff through soil, which, in turn, can actually influence sediment flows into rivers. And, of course, reduced sediment load is one of the um, uh, 
uh, aims of the Water Framework Directive and sediment loads uh, can be a, a major problem. So I could, you know, have presented a, a range of other examples. For example, how um, the diversity of algae and microorganisms within rivers actually influences the rate at which um, uh, pollutants are broken down. Uh, but I was so terrified of overrunning my five minutes that I cut out that second example. Um, so, but I do want to just finish off by uh, sort of uh, saying that actually this, I could have slotted this talk into many different um, sessions at this conference uh, because all these things are very interlinked. If you, for example, decide water quality is your principal goal, you might want to plant a, a grass buffer strip. Um, but if you actually have other ecosystem services in mind, that uh, buffer strip uh, might contain a pollen and nectar mix, for example, if your primary aim is to underpin um, pollinator services. So uh, we need to sort of uh, intelligently manage all these different as aspects together um, to work out what the best combination uh, should be uh, from agricultural land. And it's these, this kind of un these underpinning understandings of how biodiversity contributes to this process that then feeds into the sorts of valuations that Ian's going to talk about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're actually ahead of schedule, so I'll ask you a quick question. So you said at the outset that ecologists and economists are going to have to work more together. Can you yes. give some examples of where that's happened that you've seen uh, that work successfully? Well, um, it, you know, it's, it's happening now in, in sort of two main areas. Uh, one is actually I Ian was the principal investigator in something called the Valuing Nature Network over the last uh, two or three years, which has really been trying to bring together academic and stakeholder communities in this area. Um, and the research councils are now are about to launch another major um, funding initiative on valuing nature, which is kind of partly been, you know, that the uh, Ian's um, Valuing Nature Network sort of gave birth to that, that new initiative. Um, but also, uh, both Ian and I uh, sit on something called the Natural Capital Committee, uh, where we're actually, uh, it's a small group of largely economists, but also myself and Georgina Mace, who's another biodiversity scientist, um, where we're actually uh, working out how we can integrate the environment more effectively into decision making for government. Uh, and we're doing that in a, in, a, in a number of ways. One way is we're actually uh, working out the kind of uh, metrics that we can draw out from our existing monitoring systems to indicate where we're using natural capital unsustainably. Ian can also talk to you about much of the work he's doing on um, valuing changes in, in natural capital. Um, but we're also working on how to incorporate uh, natural capital into the national accounts with the um, Office of National Statistics. Okay, good. Thanks. All right. Ian. Thanks. <coughs> Anyone want to advance this, or would you like me to? Uh, if you could start. <coughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Rosie was far too kind there, but uh, uh, I would like to say I'm an economist with lots of uh, ecologist friends, uh, of which uh, you've probably worked out that Rosie is one. Um, so, uh, I, w I was asked to talk about water, but I, I also want to finish on some other stuff as well, and how we might value it. And the key thing that you have to start with is understanding what the effects of change are because actually um, in the past there's been a huge foray about what's the value of this and that and not enough emphasis certainly in economics on what's the quantities that you're going to actually be applying those values to. So the first thing to do is look at what the consequences of change are and to do that you have to uh, allow for the fact that there are many drivers of change um, uh, in the real world environment and just trying to look at one 
uh, on its own is actually a very bad idea. You've got to look at it in, in conjunction with all the other uh, things that are going to make things change. Uh, you have to be careful to make sure that whatever model uh, you're using to predict the consequences of change works well. Uh, there's plenty of papers on this if you're, if you're interested, but I thought the easiest way is just do it in pictures. So here is what actually ha uh, happens over a period of time, and this is what the model out of sample predicts will happen for that period of time. You can see it predicts pretty well. And given that it works pretty well, you can then begin to ask questions about what might be the changes uh, that are induced by um, uh, influences upon this system. Uh, the one I'll illustrate it with is climate change, although you could look at a policy um, as well as this, but uh, climate change in the UK is going to make things warmer and a bit drier, and um, if you're not familiar with the UK, that's actually a pretty good thing because it's neither of those things at the moment. And that's, um, that's not just good for us, it's good for plants as well. So a, a lot of, uh, although climate change is going to be very bad for the world environment and for the world agricultural systems, uh, a, a point that our Secretary of State skipped over when he then said, but it's going to be good in Britain. Yes, it is going to be good in Britain, but uh, the uh, effects of commodities uh, uh, dislocation are, are going to be very bad. So once you uh, have got a change that you're interested in, you can feed it back into that model that you've tested and see what the consequences are. So here, for example, is uh, predictions of what's going to happen uh, to just two particular agricultural uh, activities um, uh, over sort of roughly the, the, the next sort of 50 years. And increases in um, uh, certain arable crops, decreases in some pastoral activities. Why? Because it's warmer and drier, so you can move into things that make more money and move out of things that make less money. Uh, right. So if you know those changes, you can now think, well, what are the consequences of those changes? And one is that if we're going to get fairly substantial amounts of land use change, you're going to get changes in water quality as well. So here you've got uh, impacts on, on one particular nutrient, but there's, there's loads that you could uh, uh, actually uh, look at. And this means that the ecological status of the water is going to change as well. And that is going to have consequences in terms of values, things that people care about. And there's like quite a lot of uh, consequences for this. Some of them are actually very easy to, to uh, value. So this is going to uh, change uh, the uh, amount of treatment that water companies are going to have to apply to uh, abstraction. It's actually not very interesting working out the um, cost of that, so I thought we'd focus on something that's a bit more difficult to value. The fact that this is going to also influence uh, recreation uh, on uh, British uh, rivers. Uh, how can you value recreation? You could do something crazy like just asking people how much do you think, how much more pleasure would you get from clean or dirty rivers? That really wouldn't be a very good idea. Instead, you can look at what people do and how they react already to uh, different qualities of river. And uh, in Britain, we have lots of different qualities of river. Um, so from an experimental point of view, it's a really good place to do this. Not so good if you actually uh, want to find a clean river, but uh, you, can, you can go out and do surveys. The government now are doing 50,000 surveys a year Diary surveys, amazing data set. It's been done for uh, four years, so we're up to nearly 200,000 records. You can find out where people live and where they go to. You can also see how often they go to these places. You can then link that to um, uh, databases that will tell you how difficult it is to get to these places. That brings in issues of cost both in time and uh, money. And you can then add in additional data on what's the quality at these sites. And if you think about it, you've now got all the information you need to look at the trade-off that people are actually making between quality and money. Yep, OK. Um, OK, and you can work out values uh, in that way. <coughs> 
Okay, got to speed up, I'm afraid. Uh, you can do this for lots of different changes. Something we've just finished on is the government reckon it's going to uh, plant an awful lot new, of new forests. If they ignore all the externalities, then for this particular part of Britain, that's where they're going to plant the forests, a hell of a long way away from where people actually live. If you include externalities, they're going to plant in very different locations. That will have impacts upon water quality. Planting trees, the impacts are almost uniform. Well, in, in certainly in terms of this particular um, uh, pollutant, they are uniformly positive. Uh, trees are really good at cleaning up rivers. What this will mean is that we end up with benefits and, um, and costs. The costs will fall upon farmers, for example, and the benefits will generally fall upon the rest of the population. Do the calculation, very, very good idea from society's point of view, but it's not a good point, uh, idea from the farmer's point of view. So Lawrence is going to come in and say, well, what do we do about actually efficiently arranging compensation for farmers for this? I want to finish on one last point to do with biodiversity. I know we've mainly talked about um, water, but you can do this for biodiversity as well. You can first of all look at the impacts of different land uses upon biodiversity, and it's absolutely colossal. This is the trajectory we're on at the moment. Red is not good. Uh, green is good. So things, things have been bad for a long time. Actually, climate change is going to make things worse, both because of direct effects and because it will induce land use change that pushes biodiversity even more. But there are lots of alternatives. What could we do we could to value this? We could do a really crazy thing. We could ask people questions uh, like how much are you willing to pay for the striped china? And people will give an answer because they're nice and polite. Um, it's a really not a good idea for the, for the reasons that you can uh, read up there. So instead, what you can do is actually do what's called a cost-effectiveness analysis. You can say, right, we've got some policies at the moment Actually, this is slightly better than what we do at the moment, but I won't go into this. We could go to alternative policies where we actually consider the other effects, the other externalities. All I really want you to take from this is that it would radically change land use policy. Okay? Once you take things like greenhouse gases, recreation uh, and water quality into, into uh, uh, effect and l allow them to, to influence land use. What you find is that coincidentally it results in a land use which is very good for biodiversity as well. We did some um, costs on if you did this and you actually then put in some additional constraints which said no area in Britain must, uh, can uh, actually result in biodiversity loss. Actually, it makes very little additional change. You've already got the things you want from just taking in those other externalities. Taking in those other externalities makes a massive gain for UK citizenship. The, the additional cost of also making sure that species don't um, go extinct is just the difference between those. And it's trivial compared to the gains of addressing all the others. Final slide is you could also uh, look at this for water quantities as well. Uh, lots of the stuff that I've just said still apply, but there's some, some other stuff, although it's rather boring to calculate. It's things like impacts on properties and uh, impacts on uh, output, but you can do it. Okay. All right. I said Thank I could you. be too excited. <laughs> Okay, um, so um, my name's uh, Lawrence Caldrick from the uh, West Country Rivers Trust. We're a small environmental charity based down in, um, in the West Country of, of England. And uh, this is sort of the tale of, of some of the frustrations we have when we work um, on the ground, um, working with farmers in terms of trying to get the, the address the, the true cost of food production and the, the implications um, that has. 
obviously there's sort of in our in our catchments across all catchments there's a lot of pressures out there whether they be from the urban environment whether they be from the um, the way we um, deal with waste and we've already seen um, talks today about that um, the infrastructure we have in transport and um, a lot of our land is is affected hugely by agriculture it covers about 80 percent of the land cover um, in those catchments and provides us with a, a huge loads of um, benefits now, the, the detrimental effects, the externalities that we've been talking about, um, affect the landscape in a variety of ways, um, whether it be through things like eutrophication um, and algal blooms within some of the reservoirs, whether it's things like toxic um, fish kills and some of the, um, the issues depleting around that, whether it be things like flood risk um, and some of the externalities that come along with that, or when you get down towards the bottom of the catchment where we're um, increasing our dredging and for navigation um, within that. And, and really, when you look, at our, um, you look at our catchments, you can see that what we've got in our agricultural ecosystems is, in terms of ecosystem services, is a really a slant towards the provisioning services. And that's sort of happened post-war where we've wanted more food, we've wanted more material, and that's come with these negative externalities. And one of the comments earlier about this, this issue of um, the externalities aren't felt um, linearly, um, that we, we don't just suddenly get them, we see this sort of long-term degradation of some of these other services. Now, Perhaps in an ideal world, we'd have, or in a natural um, ecosystem where there wasn't as much demand, we'd have this um, less of a demand on, on these provisioning services. But um, uh, although one of the speakers earlier on said um, the way to get at that is to reduce um, population density, um, that's, that's possibly more in the realms of, um, to get to this level is more in the realms of a James Bond villain in terms of reducing population density. So. What that means, though, is, is these, that detriment on other ecosystem services, we get at that and we address that by coming out with plans. And we're very good as a society of sectorising and looking, thinking of silos. So we come up with our plan, whether it be about water quality abstraction, whether it be about flood risk. These are all the plans that hold bearing to the River Tamar, which we looked at when we worked with some of the stakeholders. The trouble is there's a huge complexity and diversity. How does one farmer or one landowner understand what's being demanded of them by, uh, by the rest of the community. There's a, a huge amount of information that you could start picking out in there, from the conservation management of an area, to the tourism, to the water quality, to the flood risk protect, um, protection within there. So it's in incredibly difficult. And all those groups, all those sectored groups, also have only a few tools, really, with which they can, can look at on the, to deal with um, and work with farmers on the ground. So you either do things because you're forced to do it, you're regulated, so the polluter pays. We've already spoken about that. Um, you can start talking. We, we do work with a lot of farms. We don't have ability to regulate because we're a charity, but we do have the ability to provide them with advice on why they might save money, so soil management, nutrient management, some of the stuff we've been talking about earlier on has worked wonders in terms of getting that change in behaviour. And then when it doesn't, um, isn't of business interest to the farmer, when perhaps we're asking too much, we might be putting on quite large buffers, we need to start thinking about that incentivization. How do we address that balance? And so we come into the provider is paid and some of the, um, the, the payments for ecosystem services schemes set up. So what does that look like in reality? Well, historically, we'd go out to a farm and talk to the farmer about this sort of issue, um, direct access. We'd talk to them about the impact on their farming. So the fact that there's stock straying, there's lameness in that stock, there's issues with cleaning the udders in terms of um, uh, the, in the dairy herd, and there's things like mastitis that you can deal with in the vet's bills. And that is enough to change practices. What we get out of that, or what we historically started off um, doing, is improvements in things like the water quality for fisheries. And so we can enact change. And we can sit there and put in a, a change which narrows that um, system, that improves the, um, the, 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 the area, reduces the, the externalities within that system. But we know it also improves the water quality. It improves the biodiversity moving up and down that um, water course. And there's an element of carbon sequestration in terms of changing land use. So that's a, a very small example because it's quite a small buffer. So the interesting one is about how we start looking at some of these external benefits we've now put into the system and how we can start costing that up. So we do a lot of work now on payments for ecosystem services and how we start doing that. So this is probably old hat to, to some of you where 
currently the system is just looking at private profits and looking what's available to them. What, what we're really doing is trying to change the system and look at the marginal change in those externalities and start saying, okay, well, how, how, um, how um, obvious and overt are those markets and how much money can we tap into to make that change? So whether we're looking at a profit foregone situation where we're just trying to get them to change practice or looking at genuine new markets where they would change because it's of, of financial interest to them and they, they might be able to exploit the, the, that um, theoretical maximum um, payment. So what's that look like in practice? Well, we've got um, Southwest Water. They have um, increasing um, water treatment costs. So they came to us and said, well, look, we've got an issue. We've got increasing water treatment costs in terms of phosphate, in terms of nitrate, in terms of um, pesticides, in terms of sediment that are coming through this river. So they convinced Offwat to, um, to take 65p from every bill payer. And uh, we know that we need to instigate farming practices. And there are changes we can make, the farmers can make. Not all farmers wear pitch of dungarees and have a pitchfork. Um, but then um, Southwest Water guys don't always wear um, ties, or certainly the guys I work with. Um, but the thing is, they don't have a they don't have a link. There's no Southwest Water have never historically worked with any of the farmers, whereas we have. And what we've been able to do is sit in the middle as what I would call an ethical broker, where we're trying to get the benefits that Southwest Water want but not at the detriment of any other service. And effectively, that's what's happened within the production of food. We've wanted food, but we haven't costed in these externalities, and the people purchasing them have neatly sought to avoid that. Um, and, and so we, we are where we are. So what does that look like on the ground? Well, it looks like this. We have the situation on the left, which is where most of our farms are in the West Country. Not all of those issues are um, regulatable. Um, some of them can be dealt with through things like win-wins and incentivizations, and it's shifting to that image on the, on the right. So in terms of what we do with farmers, we go from these sorts of situations on the left with the infrastructure um, payment, we can shift to systems on the right. Um, the capital works are, are one of the conditions that Southwest Water have to pay for capital. They actually can't pay for revenue in, in, in what they do. So there's some interesting dynamics about what a buyer can and can't do within that situation. We then obviously are interested in what the outcomes are of that, so we can start looking at things like, well, okay, we can. it's very hard to actually um, quantify on a catchment scale what the benefits are because there's so many variables going on. If you sit uh, a water quality probe at the bottom of the River Tamar, um, there are so many things happening in terms of land use change, in terms of the price of wheat um, altering what's happening in there, in terms of the weather that year, that it's actually incredibly difficult to do. So what we tend to do is model what those benefits are. So we can look at things like phosphate and what the current situation is, then talk about what sort of uptake we've had in any one catchment or one area, and therefore what change would happen. So they're interested in the actual net um, decrease in phosphorus and nitrate, um, nitrogen within there, but the, the coloration is actually against things like Water Framework Directive and the shift um, we have in, in that. Now that information they can then take on and, and look at what the business savings are, are for them. So that's the, the benefit for the water company. The interesting thing is that's one externality. And what we have been trying to do is, is and I was speaking earlier on about the spatial variability of these externalities. This is just a map of drinking water abstraction and the areas that are in, of interest. And this is something we've been spending a lot of time, this is one of the first draft maps, we've improved upon these um, tenfold, but these one actually serve quite a nice um, sort of visual message in the fact that the water company only abstract from certain locations. So the area upstream of them are of interest to them. Then there are places like the, the strategic reservoirs within that catchment which are doubly important to them in terms of how the water getting to that reservoir is, um, is, is, is presented to the reservoir and then how that water then transmits through the river system and then is abstracted finally down here. But we can start looking at risk mapping, we can start looking at areas that have a higher risk than other areas, but you can see that not all areas are equal. The interesting thing is by working with various different businesses, we can have this same discussion about their externalities, their issues, where, they, where the demand for the service is felt. This is one of looking at things like flood risk management. So on the Tamar, a very, this is the River Tamar, it's a very different picture in terms of where 
flood risk is felt in terms of properties in the floodplain, whereas on the X, it's very different. We can do the same thing with things like biodiversity and sitting down with a lot of the biodiversity guys about, again, the provision of those services, where they're needed, where we would put um, investment. And if you think about this as a dial, if you had a, a hundred thousand pounds, where would you put it? If you had a million pounds, where would you put it? And you can start looking at that. The, the neat thing about what we've tried to do there is effectively you're trying to speak the same language. So if you think about all those plans, you're able to sit there and say, well, look, this is how they start linking in together, whereas before we haven't been able to. So you come out to something we call the, the blue blobby map, which just starts picking about some areas where, look, where there's multiple interests in this area, and this was where we should be acting. Now, the interesting one within that is the opposite. The reverse of that also shows you the areas where there isn't the overlap. There isn't the same amount of interest. And so in terms of if we wanted to look at intensive agriculture, if we wanted to look at food production, there are still areas in a landscape where they might be flat, they might be disconnected from the river, they might be quite stable soils, and there might be very few people downstream that are affected. And so we can start having some really interesting discussions. And then finally, you can start looking at the fact that when you overlay that blue blobby map, with actually where the current food production is, you can also start identifying where there are conflicts, where there's really heavy agriculture on areas of land that we've just deemed as being really important for biodiversity, for water quality, for carbon sequestration, for flood risk, for all these different things. So effectively, we can go from this system on the left to a system on the right, and by doing that, we can balance the benefits we get um, so we get to a, a more sustainable um, environment where both the sort of the needs of the society are also brought in around the business needs about having a, a, an effective and profitable business. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, so let me open it up for again uh, questions for panelists or observations as you listen to the three presentations. And for those of you who were in the previous session, if you have any connections back to that as well, I've got a few thoughts, but I'm gonna open it up and see who would like to jump in first here. And again, if you could introduce yourself. Uh, Nick Silver again, uh, sort of my Instagram actually is hat on here. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, questions this time. First of all, I, um, I, I interviewed John Kay, who's like a leading, quite a well-known economist. And he, one of the striking things he said is, we, we economists don't understand the way the financial economic system works. The people who do are ecologists, right? So I wanted to ask Rosie, uh, uh, have you ever had a chat with your economist friends about why their models don't work, why they're still using general equilibrium models when you abandoned those about 40 years ago, right? Um, and shouldn't you, you know, if you want change, actually this is the way you get change because economists don't think about the economy correctly so they can't possibly won't make correct decisions. Then my second question was for um, um, Professor Bateman. Um, really interesting talk, but I, I, I'm a actually think about insurance and risk, uh, and I wondered how you thought about risk. Because, for example, there's no on a cost-benefit analysis, there's no point in buying insurance. You, you, it's negative, but you still buy insurance. You know, so uh, think about water quality, f floods. It's I'm not interested in the best case. I'm interested in the worst case. You know, the extreme tail. And and how do you price risk and uncertainty in your your analysis? Okay, so we'll start here. My guess is not if, but how often you have that conversation, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I suppose, well, yes, there's, um, there's a surprising amount of uh, um, sort of commonality, I think, between ecologists and economists when, when you start discussing things, in that um, you're dealing with uh, dynamic systems that, you know, are very complicated, have multiple drivers, uh, and also have, have um, things called, you know, thresholds where you might um, kind of pass a certain point where you're flipping from one stable state to another. So... Um, you know, but I wouldn't presume as an ecologist to um, suggest that we understand the, the, you know, the complex dynamics of many communities. Um, but uh, there are a lot of, a lot of parallels. So, um, yeah, we just need to work more effectively together. That's what I'd say. <laughs> yeah, I, I echo that first bit. I, I actually, um, I find that methodologically, I find it much easier to work with a lot of my natural science colleagues than some of the more sort of philosophical types who I just don't understand what they're talking about really, but that's probably because I'm an economist. Um, I'm not gonna defend uh, 
economists, uh, macroeconomists' abilities to forecast, because I know nothing about that. It's not anything I've worked in. I've spent 25 years uh, looking at uh, the environment and the relationship uh, that it has uh, with the things that people value. Um, nearly all of the models, no, all of the models that I just showed you are stochastic, which means that, of course, uncertainty is inherent in every element of it. And um, the challenge, I think, is to try and get some information on the degree of variability uh, into uh, uh, decisions. And that's not easy. So, for example, um, and it's not always that economics, uh, uh, sadly, that is the problem. Oh, problem. The, 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 the real thing that has to be addressed. So there's, there's great uncertainty about the relationship, say, uh, between pollinators and the economic values that are generated. But I have to say, actually, I think the big source of uncertainty there is, is the limits that we have on our natural science understanding of the relationships between the different ways we manage land and consequences for pollinators, and even then the, poll the consequences further on to things like crops. Um, the natural science, um, I, I, I don't think I'm talking out of turn at all, but I say the natural science uncertainties there are enormous, absolutely enormous. I spoke to uh, one of the more eminent professors at Cambridge in zoology, uh, when we were doing this thing called the NEA and said, um, so what would be the consequences of getting rid of the bees? And he said, might be absolutely nothing. We don't know. Difficult to incorporate that level of uncertainty into any economic analysis. Okay, thanks. thanks. Introduction. Michel, <coughs> Michel Scholte from uh, TruePrice. Uh, I had a question um, for um, uh, Lawrence. Um, to what extent did you consider the expected um, financial returns of the improvement uh, uh, project um, at the moment when you uh, budgeted the project or when you um, asked for the investment of, of the partners? That's, uh, the, 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 it's an interesting one in terms of for things like the Southwest Waters um, project. I mean, when they when they initially costed it up, they costed it up looking at things like uh, the the main thing that drove them to do it was the fact that they were asked to look at their investments over a 30-year period rather than a five-year period. And what that meant is it took in things like investment in inf their own investment in infrastructure so rather than just treatment costs. So it was looking at things like having to commission new, new reservoirs or new um, treatment plants and then the running costs surrounding those. And so because we were working on multiple catchments, there's multiple um, drivers and there are multiple um, improvements. But some of the clearest ones comes from things like the, the reservoirs and the, the fact that that the reservoirs, some of the reservoirs are filling up with sediment and they're also um, having algal blooms which means that when they die back they're filling up and so what it means is that those reservoirs effectively have to be decommissioned um, and you start looking at new ones and so the costs involved in that are huge and even the delaying of those gives you some massive benefits. So some of those case studies and some of the things, we, th there's various figures bandied around in, in cost-benefit ratios of things like 65 to 1, and most of those are still tied very much to, the, um, to the just the water quality or the water quantity issues without looking at any other benefits that are derived from it. So things like um, there's some moorland restoration which they're looking at on, on Exmoor, which is about water quantity and about how much water that retains. And the initial sort of findings they're, they're looking at is the, the restoration of that moorland actually gives them the same volume of water as some of their larger reservoirs. The difficulty, though, is the fact that it's not as deployable. So they talk, as a water company, they talk about deployable assets. So it's not enough to have the water. You've got to be able to say, I want water now, and turn on the tap, as it were. And that's harder to do on a more naturalized system. So there's, there's complexity within their own calculations um, and talking to peers before um, the, the, the break about their own complexity within Thames Water. 
this is still a new science, so it's a still a new, uh, a new field where people are, are having a go and then trying to evaluate afterwards what the actual savings were. I think the stuff we do in terms of water quality is probably some of the hardest ones because it's difficult to establish a baseline. Because when you do establish a baseline, you don't know whether the whole system was going downhill. And so we do a lot of paired analysis um, between control catchments to try and get at that. But it is inherently uncertain, and it's how you address that uncertainty. <coughs> investors involved who wanted to get a return on the basis of these analysis or was it like we will like was it agreed um, before the project that we will find out uh, about the positive uh, benefits and also potential positive financial benefits afterwards and you know we will split it in in what way or yeah. another that that sort of information is coming out now especially with the secondary benefits the primary benefits i think were explored in a, a quite a high degree of um of of investigation to start off with what's interesting is the secondary benefits in terms of biodiversity in terms of carbon some of those ones are, are much harder the other thing is is whether those um, benefits who owns those benefits and that's, that's something which we haven't really touched on today, which is the excludability of, of benefits when you start running schemes, especially when you're wanting to run a multiple buyer scheme. So if someone wants to buy the carbon, someone wants to buy the water quality, someone wants to buy the biodiversity, but it's the same product that they're purchasing, how do you start doing that? Who pays? How, do they, how much do they pay? And then you get onto things like free rider principles and all sorts of stuff, which gets incredibly complicated. Okay, thanks, Scott, and then Darko. Scott. So I, I, I've got a <coughs> question again for, for Lawrence and for Ian. And, and this, so when one overlays, so w when we try and think about um, managing for multiple ecosystem services, um, and, and you all have done some really interesting work overlaying maps of uh, food production suitability with maps of uh, negative externalities, and so then you can come up with the sort of combined maps that both of you have showed us, of, of what seems to be a, a socially optimal geography of food production. What do you recommend as a mechanisms for uh, getting people to follow that geography? Okay. Well, just um, interestingly, one of the things that's just happening in the UK at the moment is um, a, a, a drive through DEFRA called the catchment based approach which is about trying to get um, community groups on a catchment scale to come together and understand what it is they get from an area and how they can improve that situation. Now, we've been doing that. The, the maps that I showed were so, some we came out with through just some conversations and discussions and playing around with one of our, our the, the GIS um, sort of we, we've got uh, and looking at that. Now, what we've actually done is run that on one of our catchments with about 100 people from about 40 different organizations to create very detailed um, maps. But what was interesting in it, it the map isn't the answer. It's about the understanding that goes with that by the organizations that, that represent that map. So I, I took the, 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 the products, like things like the blue blobby maps and the various different maps, to some of our environmental planners, and they said, well, I could have told you that. And I said, well, I could have told you that as well, but I now have four, uh, 100 people from 40 different organizations that are now prepared to write into their business plans that there's a reason why the water company, the flood risk group, and the biodiversity group should come together in that location and co-fund something to get at their solution. And I think the, the trouble is, is, at the moment, is we tend to define a problem, uh, tend to define a solution around a single problem. So a sector said we're being flooded, so they go, we need to have flood risk protection, so our solution is flood risk protection. And when the flood risk, um, the governor, the, um, the government say there's not enough money, they go, how can I sell my solution for flood risk to other people? Whereas the interesting thing when you look at a catchment is you say you define your solution around a multiple set of problems, and your solution is very different. So in that situation, you might still have flood risk, but your solution might be something that is not as, it, it might be um, not the same level of, of a certainty. So you might not invest in flood walls, but you might start investing in something further upstream, a detention basin, detention ponds, um, sort of uh, swales, all sorts of um, uh, urban drainage systems that give you your flood risk protection, but also give you like water quality or biodiversity. And I think that's the real key, is the communication 
of where we stand to co-benefit. And that's where that mapping element has just allowed a language to translate across things that are quite technically, we get quite technically focused and it means people can't talk. Flood risk never talks to the biodiversity lot because they think one thinks the other is a load of um, tree huggers and the other one thinks the other lots are concrete junkies. Mm -hmm. And so never the twain shall meet, whereas this is a way of getting them to talk the same language. Thanks. Ian, anything you want to add? Well, yeah, I'll try and be brief. Uh, so, uh, first of all, we, we, I think we have to recognise that every decision involves valuation, whether you like it or not. Um, and you can pretend that you're making decisions without values, but you are. Uh, because if you say, right, oh, we're not going to have economics in this, we're just going to have tonnes of carbon and milligrams of some pollutants or that sort of stuff, and you end up with a situation and I've actually seen this done where you say, we're absolutely not getting, allowing economics into this, no way. So I think that uh, four milligrams of this particular pollutant per litre is equivalent to about uh, 20 tonnes of uh, carbon per hectare. And you just think, well, that's bonkers. Um, and then you think, well, you've got to have some consequence of that. You do that, you are imposing a cost. You're imposing a cost on the land user, or you're imposing a cost in, the f in terms of the other projects that you can't go ahead with now because you've done this. So um, all decision making involves valuation, either explicitly or implicitly. And I think the best way to do that is to, is to be ex as explicit as possible about what uh, trade-offs you're, you're actually um, uh, making. Once you've done that, I think um, we are in a situation now, and I, I fully accept that we're way uh, away from the ideal situation where we've got rid of all uncertainties and that sort of stuff, but we are in a situation where we can come up with robust values for many, many, uh, I would say the majority of the externalities of uh, changing the way that we uh, use resources. And we then can demonstrate either to private companies or to the government that there are better ways to use their resources. So in the case of, I'll, I'll use the example of the forestry thing that we've just finished for the government, we've basically shown that if they go ahead with their plans as they are likely to, and basically say, well, right, we're, we're going to fund some forestry, but we're not going to say where it is, we're just going to put some money out there, then that money will go to the poorest quality land um, in the country. You'll get a lot of planting on peatlands, uh, you'll get planting in areas where there is absolutely no recreation uh, value at all, and what you'll get is a value for money which is actually negative. And you show that to the Treasury and you say, do you want to go ahead with a, with a project that is going to cost you about uh, £20 million and result in a net benefit of minus £45 million. Do you think that's a good investment? Alternatively, you could plant in these other locations which would get rid of the greenhouse gases and um, uh, improve recreation, that sort of stuff. And for the same cost, you will be getting a couple of hundred million pounds positive every year. And you just lay it out there, and if they still want to go ahead with it, there's not much I can do about that. If they really, really want to waste their money. Okay, Darko? Yeah, thank you. <coughs> My name is Darko. I was a, sp a panelist at the previous uh, session. Uh, I would like to share an observation with me, uh, with you, and uh, also uh, put a question for all three uh, panelists. Uh, well, since some years, I've been playing with the idea that maybe we should pay farmers according to the number of earthworms or according to the density of earthworms they have because there would be tremendous uh, uh, um, a range of reasons for, for, for such a, a policy and it seems to me that with the, I'm not sure, but it, somebody told me that with the um, new technology and um, satellite and other aerial images we might be able to, uh, well, to determine the density of earthworms. I'm not sure about it. So, just an idea. And the question for all three panelists is, very simple one, what would be the three most important uh, policy tools you would put in place to, um, well, to promote 
uh, farming generating least externalities if you were a minister? Thank you. Ian, one, two, three. Well, I'm just going to go for one, because then, right. then we've got one each. Um, I would, uh, there are tools in development that might do this, but more importantly is the principle. Um, why are we carrying on making decisions based on one criteria? Whether it's the amount of wheat that's produced, or uh, the uh, livestock head, or even, I have to say, the number of earthworms. I think looking at one unit is a really bad idea. Just look at all the effects of land use change. Um, yes, it's more complex. So much easier just to choose one thing. God, you know, administratively, it's a doddle. Uh, but you're supposed to be doing things on behalf of society. Um, yeah, I mean, I, in some ways, I think even even uh, uh, trying to uh, pay for delivery of specific aspects of biodiversity to some extent would be a step forward. I mean, largely, um, the way we uh, subsidise agriculture at the moment is about, um, well, partly, uh, uh, simply, we have too much... Uh, subsidy in what's called pillar one, which is all about production, and not enough in pillar two, which is all about environmental stewardship. But then, really, uh, by and large, in, in the environmental stewardship pillar, we're, we're, we're largely um, paying farmers by what they do rather than the results. So, you know, we're quite, we're quite a long way from uh, having a system where we can actually uh, uh, reward results. Um, but I... I so I would also say uh, I agree with um, Ian about the fact that we should be we are attempting we should we should be approaching this holistically. Like in my last slide, I was showing different options, just for the simple planting of a buffer strip, give you different solutions. You know, and and you want to have the right combination of solutions for a specific spatial location. So it's quite a complicated um, problem to solve, and I think we're. We're, we're quite wa some way from it. But I suppose if I was minister, I would move more money from pillar one to pillar two in cap reform. Right. I suppose if I, if I were to do the one, two, three, I think the one is um, better and more effective uh, regulation. We have a very, certainly in the UK, we have a very complex um, suite of, of regulations that any farmer has to sign up to, which I know of no farmer that is completely compliant with because of that complexity. It's also not enforced uh, very well. The chance of being visited is one in a hundred. So the baseline of what we accept and expect from farmers uh, is not in place. So there's one big thing in there. I think secondly, you to get these win-win situations, you need advice. You need to have advice that is out there and across the board that people can tap into. Now, there's various people who give that, whether it be from from um, sort of the agronomist to even the uh, on the, the veterinary side, people who come onto a farm who work with them, and that can come in a variety of formats. So there's sort of a better, more joined-up advice. And then in terms of incentivization, that final pillar, that's sort of where you're, you're going above and beyond every, what you, you would be forced to do, what you'd save money to do, is about acknowledging that land is spatially variable. And we might not, at that point, want to just give everyone the same amount. It's about knowing that some areas is crucial that we protect and some areas less. And so it's this understanding that... Um, that and I don't think that um, within government... There's a there's a want to acknowledge that because it does mean that some land is more valuable than other land, but we know that to be true. Okay, thanks. We have one more um, person who wants to get in the queue here, and then we've got a, probably about five, six, seven minutes left. And I'd love to hear any final reflections, um, whether you were just in this session or both sessions, um, that might help inform the report back that we give after lunch. Um, that report back. I'll be doing that with Michelle. Um, we'll invite all of you, though, to add in in case we miss anything important. But again, I think Jane's intent in that session after lunch is to have some discussion among the full audience. And if you could introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, Doug Sims uh, from the U.S. Natural Resources Defense Council. We're an NGO with a broad-based broad approach to food, ag, water, energy. And um, sort of two questions to all the panelists, or two cross-cutting issues. One is, I think the issue about, about outcomes um, versus um, practices is a very interesting one. Um, 
what, right now, we work a lot trying to promote in the U.S. certification systems as an alternative to regulation because we can't really move the dial very easily in the farm bill. So in these cases, you have um, private entities um, voluntarily banding together to sort of green their supply chain through standards. Um, and some of them are in place. For example, in Latin America, there's a pretty interesting um, beef standard there, which is you know based on sort of putting in um, BMPs, best management practices. And th that's an interesting approach. At the same time, if you don't deliver the, the outcomes that you want, um, it's not going to be very, satis very satisfactory. So I'm curious to hear the panelists' thoughts just on that, that dimension. How do you deal with it? Do you combine those both? We're trying to figure it out. Love to hear your thoughts. And then just sort of secondly, um, on, that, on, that same, on that same point, um, what is the role of these um, voluntary um, um, supplier, um, retailer-led um, uh, efforts to change the system versus the government and versus the producers themselves. These middle actors, how strong are they? And is, is the UK seeing success in working with those actors? Okay. Uh, just a, lo a lot to pick apart in that. I think in terms of um, the outcomes versus the outputs, let's say, I think in that one it's it's imp I think the difficulty is, is often people, it's implicit that the output relates to the outcome. Now the trouble is we know from the science of things like buffer strips, there's a massive variability in terms of, and it's, it's you know, you have to know the right thing in the right place gives you your outcome. And I suppose the, but the difficulty is, the reason why we look at outputs is because of the fact that in a lot of situ situations it's so difficult to assess the outcome um, because of, as I was saying, on a catchment basis, there's so many variables that are going on that what happens if you don't meet your outcome because the whole system was being degraded at that point in time. So there's some confusion there. And I suppose it's just in terms of running a scheme, if I was running a scheme based on outcomes, it would be incredibly complicated compared to outputs. In terms of the, the certification, I think there's some interesting dynamics there which we've tried to explore, but I think there's such a diversity of certification schemes that's out there. I can go to a, a supermarket and buy something that's um, Red Tractor, Soil Association, Organic, um, Fair Trade, Welfare, there's so many stickers on it that I would barely see what the food was. Um, and, and I think there's, there's complexity in the market, so people don't know what they're buying and why they should be buying. And so I had someone say to me, I want my organic lamb from New Zealand. Well, the question is, is, well, what is the total cost of shipping something over from there compared to how it was farmed? I know also some organic farms that are absolutely shocking in terms of their animal health. So there's some interesting dynamics there. And um, then on, uh, what was the final point? I think the outcome versus practice <laughs> The, yeah, the second one. Let me uh, ask the yeah. other two panelists to address the first two points, and then we're going to have to wrap up so you all can have lunch. So either outcome versus outcome versus practice, and any comments on certification or supply chain initiatives? Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll just make one brief comment, because I'm absolutely rubbish at uh, answering multiple questions, because I just forget what the first <laughs> one was about. Outcome versus <laughs> practice, <laughs> but, that's one. Um, but, um, so... I, I think what the one point I would want to make, though, is that in this whole area of um, natural capital stewardship, um, there are some very important places where I think uh, businesses are actually taking the lead. There are some quite innovative businesses in the UK, for example, that are working out um, how, to, uh, how to develop corporate natural capital accounts. And in those instances, it's because... It's very much to their kind of economic advantage to do so, rather than you know simply their kind of PR advantage. So I guess in some ways it's out working out those um, examples where you can really easily demonstrate the economic benefit of managing natural resources more effectively that are, are going to be the, the kind of easiest ones to make progress in the first instance. Okay, Ian? Um, I'm going to give you a, a real a classic economist's view, which um, I imagine not everybody will love. Um, so I think things like um, voluntarism, 
and corporate social responsibility, that sort of stuff, I, are great. It's really good. And I am very keen to support such things. However, my opinion is that they will always be, I feel, um, how can I put it politely, very modest compared to the massive power that the market has. And if you can change the latter, I think you'll have a much bigger effect. What slightly worries me is that I think sometimes CSR and stuff like that is used as an excuse uh, by the government, uh, not just in this country, many countries, to duck uh, actually the changes that would release that massive market power. And that sadly involves the R word, regulation. Because if you, and it doesn't have to be old fashioned sort of 1950s style regulation, it can be regulation that actually opens up new opportunities for, for companies. Because when you do op open up those opportunities, the, the power behind it is, is absolutely colossal. So the Southwest Water thing only happened because the regulator changed the rules and allowed them to actually do something which was massively in their own self-interest because it's cheaper to stop the pollutants getting in the water than to take them out afterwards. Um, I, I think that is the, the way to go. And so I think voluntarism is good unless it's used as a shield for government not doing anything. And I, I hope you don't feel that's an, a nasty thing to say. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so another round of applause for our panelists. Thank you all very much.